Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm delighted to welcome you all uh, very warmly to this celebration of the 400th anniversary of the birth of my distinguished predecessor as warden of Wadham College, John Wilkins. And it's particularly fitting, I think, that we should be meeting in this gorgeous building, uh, the Sheldonian Theatre, whose architect, of course, was Christopher Wren, a friend uh, and colleague uh, of Wilkins at Wadham in the 1650s, uh, and part of the group that went on later to form the Royal Society. I'm, I'm sure that this is going to be a, a very illuminating uh, and enjoyable evening, and I think we should get straight uh, to the discussion with our distinguished panel. So I'm going to hand over to Lord Bragg, Melvin Bragg, uh, who's going to introduce uh, our distinguished guests. Melvin. Thank you very much. My connection with this event is that I went to Wadham College. <laughs> After that, the signs is to my left. Um, we'll, I'll do a brief introduction now uh, and then introduce the speakers who will each speak for about 15 minutes-ish, which will leave half an hour plus for questions. That's the, uh, that's the schedule and we'll try to stick to it. Uh, I find it thrilling that just across the road, over in Wadham College in the 1650s, there was a seismic shift in the nature of thought. A group of men assembled into a company by the Warden of Wadham, Warden Wilkins, took up the clarion call issued about half a century earlier by Francis Bacon, and collectively as well as individually developed a new strategy and structure for the basis of modern science. Curiosity seems to have been their watchword, and observation strict testing of results, the embracing of new technology, and the belief in the illuminating of life-enriching powers of natural philosophy. They were, in, they were welded into a system which proved remarkably fertile and resilient over many centuries. It's worth remarking that for many, this new thought came in the slipstream of the old knowledge of religion, and those involved felt that they were pursuing the same basic aims in the first decades. Of course, nothing comes from nothing, and what happened in Wadham College had been prefigured to a certain extent in earlier times by other men and women in other countries. Galileo will serve as a good example of that post-Renaissance regiment which came before Warden Wilkins. Nevertheless, with the emergence of the Royal Society, which grew out of that group across the road in the 1650s, John Wilkins himself, Christopher Wren, Robert Boyle, Hooke, and many others, and with the Royal Society's transactions, there's some case to be made that at that time there was a tide in the affairs of those men which carried the early springs of modern science into the flood we now know. The 1650s followed a time of an extraordinary bloody civil war in the 1640s, where per head of the population, more men were killed in this country than in World War I. It was a time of the death of the divine right of kings, which had ruled in this country as an idea for several centuries, and for the emergence of radical views on society proposed by the levelers and the diggers and others. With Oliver Cromwell as the chief of men, it seemed a time when anything could happen. And over there, it did. <laughs> Our first speaker is Professor Marcus Du Sotoy. Uh, Simonia Professor for the Public Understanding of Science and Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford. He is widely known for his numerous mathematical theorems, articles, and contributions on radio and television. The inspiration for today's event is, of course, the 400th anniversary of John Wilkins, the sixth warden of Wadham. Now, like Melvin, I was also an undergraduate at Wadham College, but I 
must say that uh, my first encounter with Warden Wilkins was by rather a roundabout route. Um, I think one of the great things about Oxford is that when you come up as an undergraduate, you spend a lot of time talking to people from many different subjects. So I fell in with a set of people at Wadham that were doing Persian and Arabic and uh, philosophy, politics and economics, uh, literary theory. And we would sit around at night uh, discussing the things that we did and I felt it was important for me to try and explain why mathematics was as exciting as deconstructing Henry James or reading Omar Khayyam's Rubiat. Um, now, I think that the other undergraduates who are doing sciences alongside me had a slightly easier job uh, than mathematics. I think most people kind of get what a geneticist does when they're looking down the microscope looking at cells, or um, an astrophysicist when they're looking at their telescopes at the early universe. Um, but what on earth, or perhaps not on earth, a mathematician is doing is still something of a mystery. So I would spend a lot of time trying to explain to people why I thought mathematics was as important as trying to crack cancer or trying to understand the origins uh, in the early universe of where we came from. And my own research is in the world of symmetry. And symmetry is obviously incredibly important to many of the sciences. Um, if you're a geneticist or you're studying viruses, many viruses have a very symmetrical shape and understanding that can give you some insight into the virus. Um, understanding breaking symmetry at the beginning of the universe uh, helps us to understand how uh, particles interact with the fundamental forces. When I finished as an undergraduate, a very important theorem had been proved in mathematics about symmetry. We'd come up with essentially a periodic table uh, which gives us the building blocks, the atoms from which all symmetries are built. And for me, this classification was the beginning of my own research, which I spend a lot of time trying to put these atoms together to try and see what the, the molecules of symmetry are like. So classification is a very important theme in the work that I do as a mathematician, trying to understand what's out there and when you've understood it all. I realized that I'd made some progress trying to explain to my fellow undergraduates uh, one day when, uh, as a graduate, still at Wadham, um, a colleague of mine, a friend who did English, and she'd stayed on to do her PhD, uh, suddenly threw down on the table on my mathematics a book. And she said, this sounds a bit like what you keep on saying maths is all about. And what she was pointing at was an article by Foucault. And it was actually, uh, he was describing how he'd laughed out loud at a quote by Borges. Um, Borges had come up with an, an, a fictional Chinese encyclopedia um, which tried to classify animals. And I'd like you to, uh, to read you this classification because in some way it really did sum up, I think, what I was doing as a mathematician and translates it into, well, as I agree with Foucault, it is quite a humorous classification. So this is Borges's Chinese encyclopedia. Animals are divided into A, belonging to the emperor, B, embalmed, C, tame, D, sucking pigs, E, sirens, F, fabulous, G, stray dogs, H, included in the present classification, I, frenzied, J, innumerable, K, drawn with a fine camel hair brush, L, etc., M, having just broken the water pitcher, N, that from a long way off, looked like flies. Now the quote encapsulated me for perfectly what it was I was trying to do, to try and classify and sort uh, the sort of world around me into some sort of order. And in fact that quote, that, uh, the article where Borges came up with this Chinese encyclopedia, um, although that was a fictional classification, actually what he wanted to describe was a classification, a means of classification that John Wilkins came up with. And the article was called The Analytic Language of John Wilkins. So it was a very curious, uh, circuitous route that I went from Foucault to Borges, finally to encounter Warden Wilkins for the first time. Now, Borges described how Wilkins attempted to try and classify everything in the whole universe using a new language. Um, so he started by dividing everything up into 40 different categories. And each of these categories, he assigned a two-letter monosyllable. And gradually, he would try and divide everything until you could identify everything in the universe with this language. So, for example, the word deba, John Wilkins' word deba, the D-E denotes one of the 40 categories, meaning an element. B means it's the first element, which at the time was fire. A 
the last letter, meant that it was part of that element. So Diba was John Wilkins' word for flame. And so in this way, he hoped to develop a language that he could classify the whole of the universe. Now, this wasn't just some academic exercise, because it went very much to the heart of what Wagden Wilkins believed, which is we should find a way, a common language, to be able to communicate the great ideas of science. And this was his attempt to create a language which we could communicate science to the whole public. And it was actually in this spirit that I think Wilkins and his colleagues founded the Royal Society, as much to, to make great discoveries, but also to communicate and try and get science being dialogued and tell people about the wonderful breakthroughs of science. So he wrote some wonderful books, including one which I especially like, called Mathematical Magic. Um, in these books, he talks about uh, flying chariots that he hoped would take us to the moon um, to be able to meet the moon folk that would be up there. Um, he talked about perpetual motion machines, which he hoped would solve our energy crisis. Um, he was also a man of the Baroque, so he loved the idea of um, kind of... Uh, he had all of these talked about illusions, experiments with automata that could talk, uh, magical lanterns that could make rainbows, and the architecture full of drama and surprise. Now, I think Warden Wilkins would love to come back today and see what's going on in the scientific world at the moment. I think we're living in a kind of new Baroque period. The 21st century is the new Baroque. Uh, he would come back and he would uh, discover uh, these wonderful things called iPhones on which there was kind of like artificial intelligence embedded into these things. He'd go to the cinema and see amazing artificial worlds created in front of him. He would walk around the cities and see the extraordinary uh, landscape that we built um, using the power of mathematics to somehow uh, defy the laws of physics. Uh, and mathematics truly is at the heart of much of the technology that um, is so exciting today. Um, OK, well, maybe we didn't meet moon folk when we went to the moon, but I think he would be very excited to see that we'd use our science actually to get to the moon. And perhaps our physics today explains that a perpetual motion machine ain't going to be possible. But certainly trying to solve the energy crisis will be... Uh, using all of the ideas, the scientific method that uh, John Wilkins um, uh, believed was going to be the future for humanity. And I think uh, John Wilkins would also found his belief in the importance of communicating scientific breakthroughs to society is still at the heart of the ethos of the Royal Society, very much thanks to the stewardship of people like Paul Nurse. Um, I think that uh, uh, actually the Royal Society is partly responsible for where I am today. I'm a professor of mathematics here at the University of Oxford, making new discoveries about mathematics. But I'm also the uh, Simone Professor for the Public Understanding of Science, trying to find new and innovative ways to try and communicate these great breakthroughs to society. So for me, uh, this kind of encapsulates what being a scientist is about. It's, it's about discovery, but also communication. Unless you communicate the idea and bring it alive in the minds of others, then it hardly can be said to exist. I must admit, actually, though, when I first started thinking about trying to communicate scientific ideas to the public 20 years ago as a postdoc fellow in All Souls College, college I did it with some trepidation. And I wrote, I remember, an article for the Times about uh, the Fields Medal winners that, that had won that year and about the great breakthroughs they'd made. Um, now, 20 years ago, nobody knew what a Fields Medal was. Uh, it was before Goodwill Hunting, and so Matt Damon had not explained what a, uh, a Fields Medal was. But I thought it was important to explain to society what our great breakthrough was. This, this is our Nobel Prize of mathematics, and it never got talked about. But I must admit, 20 years ago, uh, the thought of a scientist writing for the newspapers was rather looked down upon. Um, I actually grew up, uh, I, I actually became a mathematician because of a particular book that my maths teacher, I went to school just locally here at Comprehensive School, um, just outside Oxford, um, and my maths teacher uh, recommended a lovely little book called A Mathematician's Apology. It's a beautiful book about the creative art of being a mathematician. Um, and it really inspired me. I came up, I remember, that weekend when he'd recommended it. And I went to Blackwell's just across the road here uh, and bought the copy of this book. And I still have it uh, today. Um, but actually, I want to read you the first sentence of this book because um, uh, it's not really much encouragement for any mathematician wanting to tell their stories to the public. It is a melancholy experience for a professional mathematician to find himself writing about mathematics. <laughs> the function of a mathematician is to do something, to prove new theorems, to add to mathematics, 
and not to talk about what he or other mathematicians have done. So it was under this specter that uh, 20 years ago, you know, it was uh, mathematicians and scientists were meant to get on with their job. And science was pretty isolated from society, and it caused a lot of problems. Over the last 20 years, we've seen how much science has impacted on society. Climate change, how are we going to address that? The decisions we'll have to make about new energies. Is it going to be nuclear? Is it going to be um, other energies which will have their own impact on society? Um, stem cells, you know, each government has made different decisions about how they're going to use stem cells in research. Um, genetically modified crops, how, you know, that could solve a lot of problems, but it could also introduce new problems. So it's incredibly important for a society to actually understand the impact that their science is going to have on them. John Wilkins' belief in the importance of communicating science in plain English to society beyond the confines of the scholarly community is probably more relevant today than it was in Wilkins' time in the 17th century. I think it's only by understanding the science that we can be empowered. We are disenfranchised. We cannot have that debate about stem cells if we don't understand what a stem cell is. So for me, it's incredibly important that actually the Royal Society is really embodying today the ethos that I think Wilkins believed in. We should make scientific discoveries, but we should also find ways to engage society with those problems. Um, just after I wrote that first article for the Times, um, I became a university research fellow at the Royal Society. And I was a little bit nervous. Uh, I wrote another article, and I thought maybe they'll sort of tell me I shouldn't be doing this. But I got a huge amount of encouragement from the Royal Society um, saying, no, this is an important role for a scientist to play, which is why I've ended up with these dual roles of being a professor of maths and the professor for the public understanding of science. And it's also how I ended up being on uh, Melvin's program in our time to try and explain some of these ideas to the public. So in a way, I still carry on, as I did as an undergraduate in my rooms in Wadham, uh, telling my uh, mathematical stories, uh, not to my fellow undergraduates, but to as many people as will listen to them. Wilkins' message that scientific knowledge is not the preserve of the scientific elite, but should be open to all levels of society, is as pertinent in this 400th anniversary as it was in the 17th century. The scientists that made up Wilkins' scientific club that became the Royal Society changed the world. Today, the scientific community is revolutionizing modern life. It's important that those scientists that are involved in this revolution step up to the plate and, just as Wilkins did, tell their stories to a society that will be transformed by these new ideas. Thank you.